what's this about today? So I wanted to talk about a paper which has just come out. It's entitled Gravitational Wave Constraints on the Equatorial Ellipticity of Millisecond Pulsars. The front page of it, as well as the title, is basically all authors. <laughs> and in fact, if I turn to the second page, that's all authors too. And if I turn to the third page, that's all authors. Wow. The reason why it's so many authors is because it's one of the papers from LIGO and Virgo, so the Gravitational Wave Detection Consortia. And actually, this is about not detecting gravitational waves. And it turns out sometimes not detecting gravitational waves is as interesting as detecting them. They're looking at neutron stars, pulsars. So these are these very compact stellar remnants where the whole mass of a star up to a couple of solar masses is pressed down into a region about 20 kilometers across. So tiny little objects that are left over when stars blow up a supernovae. Professor, is there a difference between a neutron star and a pulsar? Are all neutron stars also a pulsar? So all pulsars are neutron stars, but not all neutron stars are pulsars. So pulsars okay. are the ones we can see. And the reason why we can see them is because these objects are rotating generally quite fast. They have a magnetic field. If that magnetic field is sort of misaligned with the rotation, then you get basically a lighthouse effect. You have the light that's being produced along the magnetic field lines through a process called synchrotron. And as the thing spins around, you basically see the flashes of light as it goes past. And so that's how they were first detected by Jocelyn Bell Burnell where she detected these very regular pulses, which are from these flashes of light as the neutron stars rotating. If it turns out that the lighthouse beam happens not to be pointed in our direction, then we won't see it. And so basically there'll still be a neutron star, but we won't see it as a pulsar. But anyway, some of them are pulsars and they're spinning, some of them very fast. Some of them are a thousand times a second. The things called millisecond pulsars. I mean, they are mind blowing things, right? You've got several times the mass of the sun squashed down into a region 20 kilometers across, rotating up to a thousand times a second quite phenomenal objects. But one consequence of that is that you might expect them to radiate gravitational waves. Now, if they're exactly symmetrical, they won't. Because if you think about it, if you had something which is actually just kind of completely, say it was spherical or even it was somewhat flattened, if it's not actually sort of, if it's just rotating around that axis, then the shape doesn't change at all in the in, in three dimensions. It just kind of rotates around, which means that the gravitational field the thing's producing really doesn't change either. Whereas if it were kind of very lopsided, as it rotated around, the shape would kind of change in the sky, which means its gravitational field would change. And one of the consequences of that is that it would then radiate gravitational waves. You can calculate, well, how much by where gravitational waves would it radiate? The answer is not a huge amount. It's nothing like the things that they've been detecting with LIGO, like, you know, these merging neutron stars and black holes and things, which produce these enormous bursts of gravitational waves. You might think, well, you know, they can only just detect these much more spectacular events how could they hope to detect one of these neutron stars? The answer is they know where to look because we know exactly what the period of rotation of these things are. Because if it's a pulsar, we just measure the time between the pulses. And so, for example, the crab pulsar goes around 30 times a second, 30 hertz. And from that, it turns out the gravitational waves are radiated at twice the frequency of the rotation period. So inconveniently, it would actually be 60 hertz, which is the electricity frequency of a fair part of the world, which turns out to be a major source of interference. So you can't actually detect it, or it's very hard to detect the crab pulsar. But other pulsars have less inconvenient frequencies that they're rotating at. So then you know exactly what frequency to look at. You can just kind of add up all the data and just search at that one frequency to say, is there anything going on? if I combine all the data together at that one frequency. It's a little bit more complicated because it could be, for example, if the thing really were slightly lopsided, it might be kind of processing around as well as rotating, which changes the frequency a little bit. It could be that the interior of the neutron star is actually rotating at a slightly different speed from the exterior. It could be kind of sloshing around faster in the interior, which again would change the frequency a bit. So you have to search around a little bit in frequency, but you know pretty much exactly where to look. So they looked in all these places. They've now got lots of data from LIGO, from Virgo, that they were able to look to see if there are any emissions from these neutron stars. The answer is there isn't any. They were able to put really strong upper limits on how much gravitational waves there are, and hence indirectly that tells you how asymmetric the pulsar is allowed to be. And the answer is absolutely tiny, right? It turns out if you wanted to make a pulsar lopsided, if you made it lopsided, so supposing you had an exactly spherical neutron star 20 kilometers across, if you distorted one side of it, literally by a hair's breadth, so by the width of a human hair, that would create enough asymmetry that with the sensitivity they had, they'd have been able to detect it. Huh. So they know to within a hair's breadth, these neutron stars have to be exactly symmetric. So, Professor, I presume they looked at a few neutron stars, not just one. They... Yep, there's about half a dozen maybe in this one. The thing I was thinking when you first started telling me about this was surely something spinning that fast 
I would have thought maybe there would be something about that process that would make it symmetrical. And the fact that all of them are symmetrical, I mean, is it a cause or an effect, I guess is what I'm saying. It's a I mean, I think even if they weren't spinning, they would still end up very symmetrical because the pull of the... I mean, they're basically held together by nuclear forces, right? And those sort of forces are so strong that they will actually pull everything in in a very symmetric fashion. But being able to measure it, you know, to within a hair's breadth for a pulsar, it really shows quite how amazingly symmetric they really are. Another way of saying this is that they would have a very smooth surface, or...? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, s smoother than the proverbial baby's bottom. They really are. It has to be absolutely smooth because any little ripples there were would create those kind of asymmetries that they'd be able to detect in gravitational waves. Smoother than a billiard ball. Way, way, way smoother than a billiard ball. <laughs> Can we make things that smooth? Is this smoother than humans can make? Or, you know, you hear things about these, you know, these spheres of silicon and stuff like that. And... That's a very good question. I honestly don't know. I'd have to do the calculation to see. Yeah, I mean, when they, one of the things when they were thinking about redefining the kilogram was about making incredibly smooth spheres of sil silicon to within kind of an, a single atom. Mm. And I'd have to do the calculation to figure out whether or not it, this is smoother than that. But it, I wouldn't be surprised if it was because, it, you know, here we're talking about 20 kilometres across and a hair's breadth. So it really is a tiny perturbation. What are we talking about when we say smooth for something that's not really matter, though, is it? We say, oh, smoother than a billiard bowl, but it's, this isn't made of matter as we know it, is it? Or uh, It kind of is. I mean, it's made of neutrons, mostly. At least it's out of crust is made what of it, neutrons. If, I know, I know there would be a lot of problems if I went close to a neutron star and tried to touch it. I'm not naive to yeah. that. <laughs> but if I did touch no. it... What am I touching? Is it is it hard? Is it cold? Is it hot? Like, what does it compare to? Just above the the surface of the neutron star is its atmosphere, which again is tiny. But there are you know energetic electrons and so on in the immediate vicinity of it. So you'll probably be able to touch those. But I honestly mm. don't know. Is this your answer? Um, but I, I, apart from the fact that I wouldn't recommend it. But beyond that, I really don't know how what you would actually feel if you were able to stroke a neutron star. <laughs> I'll put that on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there is one other thing to say about it, which is that there was already a constraint on how smooth these things were, which comes from the fact that if they were somewhat asymmetric and they were giving out these gravitational waves, that energy has to come from somewhere. And the answer is it comes from the spin of the neutron star. And so what you would expect is that if it were radiating these gravitational waves away through these kind of asymmetries, the neutron star should do what's known as spinning down. It should slow down. But that comes back to probably to um, the, the pulsar effect again. Remember I said that if there's a magnetic field which is a bit misaligned with the rotation, you'll see these pulses. One of the other things of having the magnetic field kind of spinning around like that is that in itself produces electromagnetic waves, which also carry away energy. So some of the energy being carried away from a neutron star causing it to spin down comes from this what's called magnetic dipole radiation, the fact that you've got this spinning magnet. The most conservative thing you can say is, well, let's presume, pr pretend that that's not there at all. Maybe if the entire spin down were just coming from gravitational waves, what would that mean for the asymmetry of the neutron star? And it turns out that already gives you a quite interesting limit on how smooth a neutron star has to be. What's new about this result is this is the first time they've gone beyond that limit to actually measure effectively a limit on the gravitational waves themselves rather than from this in indirect effect. Tell you what, black holes get all the good publicity and the glamour, but I think neutron stars are awesome. You know, at least they can do stuff, right? A black hole is just black and there's not much you can say about it. Interesting things go on around it. But neutron stars, you can actually say interesting things about the neutron star itself. And so 140, I mean, is, is out here. They found a bump. They found an increase in the number of uh, uh, electron-positron pairs coming out. To have a melting temperature of about 25,000 Kelvin, which is kind of the typical temperature of a lightning bolt, and the specific heat capacity of water.